Yo, new coaster. Coming to see where. Let's go. Is this it? Oh shit, it is. It's the surf coaster. It's finally happening. Oh my. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. What? What the hell is that? B&M engineers rejected his message. They hated Jesus because he told them the truth. Stand up, son. It is the year of our Lord, 2022, and Bolliger and Mabillard have decided to bring back the world's worst coaster type. Oh, but Thomas, this time it's different. There are shock absorbers, the layout is better, there's vest restraints, I think. Shut up! Many manufacturers have tried to make the stand-up work over nearly half a century, and all of them have failed. For good reason. SeaWorld may be giving it the old college try, but Pipeline is doomed from the get-go, and there's one simple reason. The stand-up is an inherently flawed concept. And today, I'm going to explain why. No! Now, there's one thing I should get out of the way at the beginning, and that concerns an issue that most men experience on stand-up coasters. Yes, these rides have a deserved reputation as nut crushers. Green Lantern First Flight may have nearly castrated me in my teenage years, but these days I am older, and I am far wiser. There is a technique for men and people with additional appendages down there to ride a stand-up without pain, but it's pretty involved. Follow me, we're about to go on a journey. First, let's walk into the train. Pick your seat, and head into the restraint. Feet flat on the floor, stand up straight. Now, put a slight bend in your knees. Are your feet still flat? No. Fix that. Now spend the next minute holding this uncomfortable position as the ride ops try to explain to other people how the ride works. Make sure you're not sitting on the seat if you want to have children. Hold on for just a little while longer, I promise, the restraint will lock soon. Okay, now stand up straight. I hope you didn't bend your knees too much, else you're gonna smack your shoulders on the top of the restraint. Now make sure your knees aren't locked, you want a slight bend but not too much of a bend else your knees will buckle in the valleys. Time to dispatch. Godspeed. So, as you can see, it is possible. I haven't crushed my balls on a stand-up in years. But I still hate them. Now my opinion does not come from a place of inexperience. I have a lot of personal experience with stand-up roller coasters. I've ridden the gamut from the humble Togo pioneers to the monstrous B&Ms of the late 90s, and all of them uniformly suck. Nevertheless, there's sort of a morbid fascination I have with stand-ups. For such a stupid idea, so many companies tried really hard to make it work. First debuting in 1982, the stand-up roller coaster concept was pioneered overseas, specifically by the Japanese ride manufacturer Togo. Funnily enough, the stand-up concept began as a retrofit, with a single prototype stand-up train joining the rolling stock of a small Japanese looper known as the Mamanga Standing and Loop Coaster. I don't speak Japanese, I don't one train would be standard sit-down fare, and one train would be a stand-up. You could pick which ride you wanted in the station for a tailored ride experience. That's a pretty cool concept. The concept was novel and deemed enough of a success to justify further propagation, so Togo embarked on a string of retrofits throughout Japan. The West got in on the stand-up craze soon after, and Aerodynamics of all companies would join in on the fun in 1983, retrofitting stand-up trains to a standard arrow corkscrew. It lasted one season. It wouldn't be until the next year, however, that these unique trains would make their debut on their own coaster model. Kings Island took a chance on Togo, opening King Cobra as the first roller coaster built to be a stand-up from the get-go. It featured a bevy of groundbreaking elements, including a sub-hundred-foot drop, a vertical loop, a helix, an airtime hill, and trick track? Oh, God, that looks painful. The ride was so well received, it made it all the way to 2001 before being unceremoniously scrapped. Paramount offered the ride up for sale, giving the coaster the chance for another life at a different park, but Kings Island just couldn't find the buyer. Shame. 
Now, in 1984, people were so blindsided by the novelty of the concept that King Cobra did relatively well. In fact, Togo opened up two more clones soon after, with 1985's Skyrider at Canada's Wonderland and 1986's King's Dominion installation Shockwave. We'll get back to that one. But now it's time to introduce a new character to the story. You know Bollinger and Mabillard, right? Of course you do. They're one of the world's most prolific and successful coaster manufacturers. And their catalog includes a large chunk of the world's hypercoasters, the first of many inverted roller coaster installations, wing coasters, dive machines, and even gigas. But everyone has to start somewhere. Right, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't let it go. We need to talk about Shockwave. As a child, I spent a lot of time going to Busch Gardens Williamsburg with the family, and we'd inevitably drive past King's Dominion on the way back. I was so obsessed with Volcano the Blast Coaster from early 2000s Coaster VHS tapes, and I would constantly nag my family every time we passed the park. Eventually, they relented and let us stop sometime in the late Paramount era, and that's when I met Shockwave. Instantly enamored by the honestly awesome color scheme, I bolted to the entrance and, well, behold, everyone, my least favorite roller coaster. Bottom of the list, dead last in my rankings, Shockwave stands alone. Shockwave is where my detestation of Sandos began, and I could not have found a more fertile ground to plant my seeds of hate. Shockwave is long gone now. Good. I hope it burns in hell. I hate you! Where was I? Oh, right, right, right. B&M began their illustrious career with a goddamn stand-up. Actually, Walter Bollinger and Club Mabiar got their start working with Intamin as part of the subcontractor Giovanola, building, you guessed it, stand-up coasters. In 1988, the two set out on their own, and the company was ready for the 90s with the debut of their first ground-up coaster project. And did you know that it sucked? B&M opened the stand-up coaster Iron Wolf at Six Flags Great America, stunning the enthusiast world with its two inversions and horrendous transitions. After years of languishing at the bottom of Great America's very strong coaster lineup, Six Flags decided to pawn off the ride to their lesser America, debuting their relocated roller coaster as Apocalypse at its new Maryland home. The ride still exists today, operating as Firebird, though the stand-up trains are thankfully long gone. Despite this fresh coat of paint and new floorless trains, however, it's still bad. B&M was addicted to stand-ups in the 90s and they wouldn't stop making them, graduating from simple, mercifully short designs like Vortex and Carowinds and Vortex at California's Great America, to mega-looping monsters like Mantis at Cedar Point, Chang at Kentucky Kingdom, and Riddler's Revenge at Six Flags Magic Mountain, the biggest daddy of them all. It seemed like this niche model had finally broken into the mainstream by the sheer force of Swedish will. And then, as the world entered the new millennium, the party stopped. No one ordered a single stand-up after 1999's Georgia Scorcher. Until now. Why then? Why the sudden change of heart? We can start with the obvious, which is that 50% of the world population can't ride a stand-up without serious risks to their reproductive organs. That alone should be enough to tank the concept, but let's assume for a second that you can ride the stand-up without crushing your balls. Like I said, it's possible. What else makes the stand-up so bad? We'll start with the restraints. Every stand-up coaster released up until 2022 debuted with an over-the-shoulder restraint, which makes sense. How would you incorporate a lap bar when riders are literally standing up? Restraining riders in the stand-up position is a unique challenge, and most companies solve this problem with bulky bars that make fond acquaintance with the rider's neck and ears. This means that there are ample opportunities for headbanging, and most stand-ups, even typically smooth B&Ms, deliver that in spades. In a normal sit-down coaster, your body is coddled by the seat and generally immobilized at the hip. The lateral motion of your body through the elements of a roller coaster is thus constrained to the top half, from the hip joint up. However, on a stand-up, the only rigid connection between your body and the train is your legs. That is, unless you rest on the bicycle seat and risk castration. Your entire body is free to wobble around and bang into the restraint, which makes you dead meat on a ride with constantly changing forces such as literally any roller coaster. Now, more modern stand-ups are an improvement over the original Togos, as they implement an engineering method known as heartlining to improve the ride experience. Basically, heartlining means designing the roller coaster around the rider's center of mass 
instead of the center of the track or one of the guide rails as seen on the Togo stand-ups. Still, with the significant amount of freedom that a rider's body has on a stand-up coaster, and the fact that forces are constantly changing throughout a ride, it's easy to accidentally headbutt the restraint through any of the quick changes in force that are the hallmark of any roller coaster. And additionally, there are points where heartlining isn't always followed, such as transitions into brake runs where the track needs to quickly unbank to line up with the brakes. The turn into the mid-course on Riddler's Revenge still haunts my battered mind. In transitions like these, the headbanging is far worse than a sit-down without heartlining, as the magnitude of lateral whip is higher, you are physically further off from the center of the rails. Now, the terrible restraints go hand in hand with the second problem. For a stand-up to work, the restraints need to be adjustable. There's just too much variation in people's heights to make a one-size-fits-all solution feasible. Thus, almost all stand-up restraints are set on vertical sliders, which move up and down while in the station and lock with the over-the-shoulder restraint. It's a delicate balance to strike with these adjustments, thus riders are strongly incentivized to get their positioning right, which is a struggle for first-time riders that have never worked with a restraint like this. This means that stand-ups are a ride-op's worst nightmare. Dispatches are inevitably glacial as most guests do not understand the restraint system, and so restraints always require adjustment after the initial lock. It takes at least two or three cycles each time to ensure that everyone is comfortable. Believe me, I've talked to the ride-ops, and they totally support my reasoning. I'm definitely not pushing an agenda at all. Here I am in July of this year giving the fist bump to Dylan, a friend of mine and a former operator on the Carowinds B&M stand-up Vortex. Dylan had the prestigious honor of dispatching me from the station on that fateful day when I decided to make this joke of a ride that is Vortex in way milestone coaster credit. You can see that this is a decision I almost instantly regretted. I even stayed on for a second ride. Why did I do that? Despite the fact that the station was almost completely empty, every single dispatch had to be accompanied with a very lengthy spiel from the ride ops. It went something like this. Please, when you get into the train, please step onto the footprints, pull your harness down over your shoulders, adjust your seat so that you have a slight bend in your knees if you want to ride without pain. Do not sit on the seat. You need to hold on until the train locks. You could be waiting two, three, even four minutes for a train to dispatch on a stand-up. All the while, the riders in the train sit idle in the station, anxiously holding their restraints in the exact right position and praying the lock doesn't push the bicycle seat into the wrong place. Alright, to be fair, it has been over two decades since the stand-up has opened, and the march of time has introduced a bevy of new technologies. b and promises a potential solution to the problems I've outlined, which brings us to Pipeline. Gone are the bulky horse collars, replaced with vest restraints which should eliminate headbanging totally. This is a very welcome addition. The other more intriguing addition, however, is the shock absorber. Pipeline's restraints move up and down with you, allowing you to bend your knees with the rise forces and promising to improve upon the sheer pain that positive Gs provide in the stand-up position. It's a clever idea, and I applaud B&M for coming up with it, though I'm curious to see how it works. Like, is it going to bounce with you? It would probably make adjustments quicker in the station and dispatches faster, though I wonder if it would add resistance if you try to stray from the lock position. I mean, we won't really know until the ride comes out. With all that said, I don't think these innovations are enough to save the model. Pipeline doesn't solve the last and perhaps most important problem with the stand-up coaster. The sensation of G-forces traveling through a rider's body. Outside of the train, stand-ups are pretty standard coasters, subjecting riders to the usual selection of vertical and lateral forces. Now Newton's third law of motion states every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So as the ride twists into a high G helix or a vertical loop, the forces are literally transmitted into your body as the coaster train stops you from flying into the track. These G-forces can go up to almost six times the normal force of gravity, which is just crazy to think about. All that force going through your body, and yet you usually don't walk off a sit-down coaster with ass pain. Right? After nine rides, my ass is kind of starting well, hey, to hurt, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, it's like really itchy. That's expected back pain and expected ass pain, but here we are. Well, that's because intense vertical forces go through your cushion tush with a wide surface area to distribute the load. Stress is inversely related to cross-sectional area, so the larger the contact surface is between your body and the train, the less physical stress your body experiences. 
Now let's switch ride types. The stand-up moves the G-force transition from your buttocks to your tiny feet. That intense compressive force at the bottom of every valley has to travel through a much smaller cross-sectional area. And I know you skip leg day, so your scrawny ass ankles are taking the full brunt of that load. And that's why G-forces on a stand-up are so uncomfortable. It's a serious spike in loading through our bodies, and our legs are just not designed to work with that. Nut crushing is still an ever-present possibility, but even that aside, the stand-up will still always be uncomfortable. It's literally exercise to ride a stand-up coaster, as your legs struggle to keep you upright, and your knees nearly buckle under the loading. Roller coasters are supposed to be a release, an experience where we give ourselves over completely and surrender our bodies to forces completely beyond our control. And sure, some older coasters and woodies require a bit of defensive riding, but there are still plenty of opportunities to kick back and let gravity take over. Stand-ups provide the opposite sensation. Instead of releasing your cares, you will be constantly reminded through the bevy of G-forces transferred through your small feet that this isn't a normal position to be in. And your final reward for a ride on a stand-up is jelly legs, as you stack on the brake run, waiting for the train in front of you to dispatch before the five minute mark. The roller coaster world has been a hotbed of innovation since its genesis. And the vast majority of the time, groundbreaking ideas have led to wild successes and pushed the boundaries of what we thought were possible. Inversions, the upstop wheel, tubular steel track, inverted coasters, even the modern wacky stuff like spinners, launches, and the fourth dimension coaster. But even in this world of infinite possibility, sometimes an idea just can't be salvaged. There's no shame in throwing in the towel when there are so many unexplored avenues and so many other markets to tap into. The future is bright for the coaster world, but I will gladly state with conviction that I hope the stand-up isn't a part of it. Thank you for watching.